I do have, a, a, you have a handout in front of you, so I do have a, a chosen subject that I've given a number of places. So if sometimes these things go online, in fact, sometimes my sermons are online at your, uh, at this congregation. So you may have heard parts of it before. The outline will be the same, but my presentations are not always exact. So thereby, I apologize if you've heard me talk about this, but well, the reason I'm talking about this subject is our world's in a real chaos. Our world's in a real mess. We've got a war going on right now, Russia, Ukraine, and there's a lot behind the scenes that's going on with the, the Iranian deal. You know, and it's my opinion that uh, they were trying to manipulate our government officials, and then Russia was, and then they turned around and tried to manipulate Iran, and so the whole deal's blown up temporarily because there's just a lot going on. China is involved. There's a lot. There's just a lot going on. People are dying. Uh, there's a, a great potential for a world war. I, I, I don't think it's going to come to that, but I have no. I have no control over that. People are looking at prophecy. How does Ezekiel come into play? How does Daniel come into play? I don't know. I'm real careful about. I'm not big into setting dates. I'm not big into identifying exactly who the king of the north is and exactly who the king of the south is. The reason I don't do that is because if you start naming things like that, you're going to end up being a false prophet. So I would recommend you take my approach to it, that you talk about it and talk about possibilities. Just don't get too dogmatic because you'll get, a, you'll get egg on your face. You know, I actually gave a Bible study Wednesday night about Revelation 18. I was talking in Revelation 18 as far as how it can help us in our world today because there is, of course, the Babylon and then, of course, the merchants. And right now, no matter what you consider for Babylon, I, I consider it a system, but I, that's only my guess. But I know the merchants get all excited about Babylon. And when Babylon falls, the merchants go crazy. Well, I don't think right now we're in the exact fulfillment of Revelation 18. However, I am learning a lot because I do know the the real the real problem is the the real rich of the world, and then it goes on layers. And probably I'm about in the fourth level down. I'm not in poverty, but that would be the fifth level. I'm I'm a lower middle class, and of course I find out with what's happening in the world. The lower middle class is getting crushed. Mom and pop businesses are getting crushed. We're getting crushed. The fourth and fifth level. And the ultra rich are still making money. And that's, that's what we have in our world today. But what I found out, I did not real. I found out that level of when, when now they're putting sanctions against Russia, I'm finding out now some of the names of the oligarchs. These billionaires who have super yachts. Super, and because they're, they're trying to confiscate the super yacht. So I'm starting to learn some of the identity of the, the super rich. And I'm, when I talk about the super rich, I'm talking about higher than Congress. You know, Congress is rich, a lot of Americans are rich, a lot of politicians are padding their, their pocketbook, but they're not even at the highest level. These oligarchs, you know, in, in Italy, they have these super yachts and they're trying to confiscate them. So I'm learning a lot. It's like, whoa, I didn't know that that, that much corruption out there and that much rich. And I thought New York City was the place where most of the oligarchs, Russian oligarchs, live. I saw a report this week that actually more of them live in Florida. But the point is, the world's crazy. The world's going nuts. And we try to understand it in Bible prophecy. And I, I talked about a little bit the, how the merchants, when the merchants start losing their money in, in, in uh, Revelation 18, they, they, they sorrow, they're, they're crying because they're losing their money. So there's a lot going on. Having said that, what I've chosen to talk about today is to encourage you and to help you. The title of the presentation is, Three Ways the Sovereign God Creates Calamity. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. And the title of the sermon here is based on the New King James Version of the Bible. Because when you read Isaiah 45, verse 7, you'll see there's a different word in the King James Version of the Bible. The concept is similar when I compare those two words. You'll see it's similar, but again, they, they are slightly different, and I'll explain what I mean by that. If you turn to Isaiah 45, verse 7, he writes here, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. 
Now, if you were reading the King James, when it says, I make peace and I create evil. The King James says evil. The New King James says calamity. The, same, the principles I'm going to talk about today apply to both. However, I view evil as worse than calamity. Okay? Even though I think this principle still apply to evil. How does God, how is God, you know, that's a good question. Atheists say, well, how does your God, how does your God answer the evil? How, how, does, how does God, if there's really a God in this world, the atheists would say, if there's really a God in this world, how is there so much evil? Why is there so much evil? But they are slightly different. Evil is to me worse than calamity. You know, calamity can be if you fall off the roof and break your leg, that's calamity. That's not necessarily evil. But so it applies both, but I'm focusing on the calamity aspect today. Three ways the sovereign God creates calamity. Because we have a lot of calamity going on in the world. We have a lot of calamity going on in our nation. We have calamity going on in our states. And you may from time to time have calamity in your life. So you see, okay, I get it, Dave. I see what you're doing. You're trying to help us deal with the calamity. You're trying to help us deal with all the mess that's going on. That's right. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. So I'm going to give you three approaches today how God's involved in calamity. These are not either or. All three of them exist. We can use the Bible to prove that God works all three ways. What we can't always prove, we can't always prove which way God is doing at the moment. But an example, I'll, I'll get ahead of myself, but I'll tell this example. When I gave this presentation one time, a, a teenager came up to me and really liked it. He was getting it. He was getting what I was saying. And the teenager said, Mr. Haver, I get it. So what, like, I, remember when the hurricane hit, hit New Orleans? Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans? And do you remember it hit New Orleans seven years later? I said, yeah, I remember that, because I noticed that too. I noticed the number seven. So he asked the question, which one of the three approaches was it? We, none of us can say. We all have opinions of which one it was. But all three of these are true. All three of these are true. And so, but the key is, God is sovereign under, over all three. The big conclusion you come away from this presentation today is, God is sovereign. And that's our, that's our hope, that's our faith, that's our life. The first one, three approaches. The first one, God initiates the calamity. God gets directly involved with the details for a specific purpose. Number two, God initiates the calamity, but God allows Satan to provide the details with, with parameters, but he does it for a specific purpose. And number three, God allows time and chance to initiate the calamity, but God will keep the calamity within the direction of his overall plan. So you're saying, okay, which way is it, Dave? It's all three at different times. We're going to use the Bible to show it's all three at different times. Now, number one, let's, let's turn over to the book of Genesis chapter 6. Someone, if you hear, and, and I've had different reactions when I've given this presentation. I've had some people really couldn't stand number one, and I've had some people couldn't stand number three, th based on their background, their position in life. And I can understand where they're coming from. I understand where their hesitation was. But see, number one is, God initiates the calamity. And there are people I've come across who say, oh, God, no, I, I can't worship a God who initiates calamity. I, I, I can't worship a God like that. And here's my comeback to them. Do you believe in the flood? If you believe the flood was literal, you, what I do, most Church of God people do, I'm not sure all of you might, I just don't know what's in your head, most religious people believe in the flood was real. There are some people who believe, believe it was symbolic. But, so then they can have an excuse to, to throw this one out the window if they want. But if you believe the flood is real, then God initiated that calamity. Look at Galatians, Genesis 6 verse 7. First of all, he, he was upset with the wickedness of the world in verse 5. He, verse 6, he was sorry he made man on the earth. Verse 7, so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. 
both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry I have made them. Verse 13, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Verse 17, and behold, I, my, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh which is in the breath of life. Everything that's on the earth shall die. So this first one is talking about God actually initiates the calamity and he provides the details. Another place you can look at is let's look at Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4 verses 21 through 23. Let me mention too, I have friends among the church of God who believe that number one is the only one. I mean, just, I don't believe that. I believe there's all, God has worked three different ways. But they believe this is the only one. In fact, they believe God does everything. Everything comes from God. They believe God micromanages that much. I believe God has micromanaged things. He has micromanaged the birth of his son for the good. He had micromanaged the flood, which was ultimate good, but was negative for the people on the earth at that point. But they believe God micromanages everything. The reason why I don't believe number one is the only way, because that takes away free choice. We have to understand what does this free choice, what is free moral will, free choice. There's some, if, quite frankly, if number one were the only way, I'm said if, if number one were the only way, this life is a cruel trick. That's the way I would look at it. So in other words, I have no say, I, I have no choice, I, I, I'm, I'm just living here and everything's happened, you scripted everything? See, to my friends who believe this is that number one is the only way, I wanna go, I'm joking now, but I wanna go up to them and smack them in the face, and they say, why do you do that? And I would say, I didn't do it, God wanted me to do it. <laughs> See, the problem I have with number one, if you think that God makes all the decisions for us, there's no accountability. People who rob banks really rob banks because God wanted them to rob banks. People who molest children, uh, God wanted them. You see how this thing, it, that's why it can't be the only way. There's got to be an element of choice involved. Having said that there's got to be an element of choice in our life, there are times we see in the scripture where God gets very involved. Exodus 4, verse 21 through 23. Remember now, the Exodus happened in Exodus 12. This is Exodus 4. I, the Lord, said to Moses, when you come back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I put in your hand. I will harden his heart. He will not let you go. See, that's God micromanaging, hardening Pharaoh's heart. Verse 22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Verse 23, so I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, I will kill your son, your firstborn. In chapter 4, he was born. In chapter 12. <laughs> this, is a, this is pretty cool, man. If you go to sleep, I'm going to hit that thing a lot of times. <laughs> It's either me hitting that thing or starting to sing, and you'd rather me hit that thing rather than sing. But I think I got the gist. If, I, if it goes dead, I'll smack that thing a little bit, okay? <laughs> you got great equipment here. <laughs> anyway, so he, he told them in chapter 4 that their firstborn was going to die. He said in chapter 4 that he was going to harden their heart. And you can go through the book of Exodus how many times he mentioned how he hardened the heart. I don't believe this is how he works with everybody all the time. That's why this, there'll be a second and a third approach. But we see he works here. By the way, my friends who believe God works that way all the time, quote from the book of Romans 9, you can check later the book of Acts, um, book, of, uh, book of Romans, excuse me, look at the book of Romans and find out how many times it says in the New Testament, Paul said that God hardens the heart. So. Paul brought that into the New Testament time in the book of Romans. So having said that, this is, this is a, a time. Walking through the, the, the parting of the sea, there were things that God micromanaged. Because that's number one, that God initiates the calamity. Number two, God initiates the calamity 
But God allows Satan to provide the details. I want you to notice Job, the book of Job. The book of Job is a spectacular book. I love talking about the book of Job. I love uh, providing good information. I think there's a lot of bad information among religious people in the book of Job. Uh, by the way, I have a little recommendation for you. Whenever you hear the book of Job, if you, if you quote from the book of Job, I got a little recommendation for you. If you quote from the book of Job, find out who's, who's talking when you're quoting it. Because there are places in the book of Job where God says he did not like the, what the three friends had to say. So you may say, you like what the three friends had to say. God said he didn't like what the three friends had to say. So sometimes people will use a concordance and they'll find a scripture. But you better find out who's doing the talking. If you give a presentation, find out who's doing the talking. If you're listening to the book of Job, here's a little thing I hope I influence you the rest of your life. Every time you hear the book of Job quoted, find out who's doing the talking. You may find out the speaker's not as prepared as he should be and doesn't get it, but you as an audience want to get it. You find out who's doing the talking. A little tidbit for speakers, tidbit for audiences. When Job chapter 1, verse 8. Well, let's look at verse 6. Uh, there came a day when the when the son, when God came to present themselves before the when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan was there. The Lord asked Satan, "Where'd you come from?" He said, "Ah, from to and fro, walking back and forth." You know, he's just giving some vague answers. Verse eight. Look at verse eight. Do you know this? Do you know who started the trial in the book of Job? God did. God did. Do you know who starts some of your personal trials? God does. If, uh, number three, not necessarily so. But one and two, God starts the trial. Who started, okay again, who started the war in Russia and Ukraine? Approach number one would be God did. Approach number two would be God did. Approach number three would be time and chance, but God's going to use it for his good. Okay, that's the summary of that. But see, he said, look at verse 8, Have you considered my servant Job? It's like tapping Satan on the, the shoulder. Hey, have you considered my servant Job? Well, that would get Satan's interest. Well, what, what are you talking about? What do you have in mind for your servant Job? Why are you involving me in your servant Job? There's none like him on the face of the earth, blameless and upright. Well, Satan's answer was, in verse 9, Does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you put a hedge around him and around his household and on every side? Why, you bless the work of his hands, you bless his possessions, you've increased his land. Now, verse 11, he provides some details. God started the trial. Approach number one, God does the details. Approach number two, Satan does the details that God approves. Because God is sovereign. He has to approve it. Stretch forth your hand and touch all that he has. He will curse you to your face. And God said, details approved. All that he has is in your power, but you can't touch him. Because God still has the hedge, because he's still sovereign. Satan said, ooh, 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 let's do it this way. And God said, okay. I'll pull back the hedges a little bit. Because you know, again, maybe, maybe Satan was saying, hey, let, let, let me cause some trouble in, in, in Ukraine. And God could say, what do you mean? What are you, what are you, what are you talking about? Let me cause some trouble in the Ukraine. Because he could say, well, I can't, because Satan would say, I can't do it if you block me. But if you open the door, let me cause some trouble there. And so it happens. Notice chapter uh, 2, verse 3. The same thing. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the face of the earth. Verse 4, more details, different details, added details, worse details. Satan answered and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that the man has, he'll give for his life. Stretch out your hand now and touch his bone, touch his flesh, and he'll curse you to your face. And God said, Details approved. Behold, he's in your hand. You can, you can now touch him, but you can't kill him. 
So God's still in charge, but the difference here is Satan provides, number one, God provides the details. Number two, Satan provides the details. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 22. You have an interactive Bible study, which I think is great. We have, we have an interactive Bible study before church as well. I think interactives are really good, and obviously you do too, because you came and enjoyed the interactive study. You get to share your thoughts and opinions. You, 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 you know, in, in this presentation today, I'm planting seeds. In the interactive Bible study, you're all planting seeds. In our fellowship afterwards, we're all planting seeds. We let God give the increase. But this, what happened here is like an interactive study, okay? First uh, Kings 22, verse 20. Well, again, uh, he, verse 19, Therefore I hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, all the host of heaven, standing on by his right hand and on his left. The Lord said, because he says, I have, I have something I want done. But who's going to give me the details? Who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? That's what I'm going to do, God said. What are your details? Any of you have any ideas? So one spoke in this manner, and one spoke in another manner. Like, again, whether they raised their hand, they could have raised their hand and said, Ooh, 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 I, I, I think you can, make, you can make him fall this way. And someone said, No, 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 you can make him fall this way. Verse 21, Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I'll do it. And God said, What are your details? What's your plan? What's on your mind? And the Lord said, in what, in what way? And the Spirit said, I'll go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And God said, plan approved. Details approved. You shall persuade him and you shall prevail. Go and do it. So you see the difference? God's still in charge. God starts, the, God starts it in number one. He still starts at number two. Number one, he, God provides his own details. Number two, Satan provides details. The third one, God allows time and chance to initiate calamity, but God will keep the calamity within the direction of his overall plan. Let's notice Ecclesiastes 9 verse 11. There is a place for time and chance. Again, so like I said, I told you earlier, some people didn't like number one because they, they, they don't like God creating some of those details. There was a lady one time, I won't say where it was, it was a, a church visit, it was interactive, and she actually had tears in her eyes. And she goes, I, I just can't, I just can't understand, wrap my mind around a God that allows time and chance to happen. And that was because of her background, her experiences. See, God's still in charge, and God still loves us, and God still does what's good. But we have to understand, there is a time for time and chance. And by, by giving this presentation today, to show you all three ways, we can see, okay, these are different ways God works. In Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11, I like to use the word always. I like to interject the word always in here. It says, it says the race is not to the swift. The battle's not to the strong. I like to say the word, the race is not always to the swift. The race is not, oh, the battle's not always to the strong. Bread is not always to the wise. Riches are not always to men of understanding. Favor is not always to men of skill. Time and chance happen to us all. Okay, so Dave, are you saying time and chance is 90%? No, I don't think of that. I, I, quite frankly, I don't. I only have opinion of. I only have opinion of which is one, two, and three. I only have. You only have opinions of that, of when they occur. I just know that God has worked all three ways. I know that God will work all three ways. But like when something happens, it's like, well, I'll find out in the kingdom. Dad, I like, I like call him Dad. Dad, when Ukraine and, and Russia got into in the thing. Did you micromanage Russia's attack, which would be number one? Did you allow Satan to nudge you that to happen, number two? Or did it just happen and you made the most of it because you're the sovereign God? Now you and I have opinions about which one it is. 
God will tell me exactly what it is. And by the way, we're going to be wrong about many things. When I sit down with God, I'm going to say, God, you were greatly involved in this, weren't you? He's going to say, no, no, you kind of brought that on yourself, but I made, I made, you know, I made lemons, uh, lemonade out of lemons. And other things, we're going to say, God, you weren't involved in that. He goes, no, I was really involved in that one. But again, remember this, the point is, all three, God is sovereign. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. Let me again remind you a very basic thing. Sometimes people don't get this, but I want to read this scripture, Matthew 5, verse 45. I'll read in verse 40 to get the flow. I'll read 44 to get the flow. But time and chance, it says, happens to everybody. Not all the time. Now again, I don't, know how, I don't know how much is time and chance in your life and how much is one or two. But it, I know some people think nothing's time and chance. Well, I'm going to show you from the scripture that time and I already showed you time and chance exist from Ecclesiastes. But I want to show you from Jesus' own words that time and chance exist. So quite frankly, if, I guess if you have an issue with that, you're going to have to take it up with him, not me. I'll read verse 43 first. Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he, our Father in heaven, makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. Our Father in heaven sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So when a tornado hits Kentucky, is it only the bad people who get killed? Are there good people getting killed? When a tornado comes, when a hurricane comes in Florida or t South Texas or South Louisiana, is, is it only the good people who lose property? When a storm comes, does the snow only come on the bad people and you never get snow? Have you ever lost electricity? Have you ever lost animals? See, things happen. These things happen to us. And sometimes the bad people suffer a little, and sometimes they suffer none. And sometimes. So, again, we talk about how time and chance occurs. This is the third one where it happens, but God makes it good. He makes, he thinks, makes things happen good. Now, turn to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. I'm always amazed by some stories I hear in 9-11. Let me give you an example of something. Uh, yeah, I, I miss the days when I could fly so easily. I miss the days when I didn't have to stand up, get an hour and a half early to go through line and get everything checked before I get on a plane. There were days I would, I would arrive at the airport Uh, the plane was to take off and I would run up there and walk right to the thing and check in right because I, I never check luggage I always carry carry-on bags I've done enough traveling I've got it down to a science how I can do my carry-on bags and never check luggage and so I would run I run in there and I walk right on the plane 10 minutes before it happens now you, you got to get there an hour and a half sometimes two hours early I, I do fly out of Shreveport quite a bit because uh, it's easier than Dallas and if I'm going east, I do fly out of Shreveport. So that really works out really well for me, flying out of Shreveport. But I miss the days when I could just switch planes, too. I could just switch planes. In other words, what happened would be I'd be, I'd be ready to fly home at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and we get to the airport at 1 o'clock. And I would go up to the, the desk and say, can I get on the earlier flight? And so that's harder to do that today, but I still sometimes get on an earlier flight. But there were people in 9-11 who lived in California, who were working on the East Coast, especially up in Boston, and they got done with their work, and they wanted to get home to see their family. So they got on an early flight. And when they got on an early flight, they died. 
I call that time, some of that time and chance. Look at this here, Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Let's stop right there. You've heard the phrase being at the wrong place at the wrong time. That doesn't apply here. They were at the right place at the wrong time. The sacrificial system was still in effect. The Son of God was coming to change that system, but he had not yet died. He had not been resurrected. They were still doing the sacrificial system that we don't have to live under today because Christ is our sacrifice. They were at the temple, which is the right place to be. They were at the temple doing their sacrifices. Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I, I, there was a church, I had two, two examples of this happening, at being at the right place at the wrong time, helping out. I would go to Wisconsin, I think I may have told you this before, I'd go to Wisconsin up to Hal Geiger's place and we would, we would have a barn dance and we would have church in the barn. We'd be dressed in our jeans, we'd be just church in the barn, have a great time. We would invite the other congregations to come, they wouldn't come because they, they, wouldn't, they couldn't go to, they had to go to their own church. They, they, could, they couldn't share with us even though we were Sabbath keepers with most of the same doctrine. But to their credit they would come at night because then the barn would turn into a dance. And up in Wisconsin, I would be up there and I would sing karaoke with some of the people from the, the Living Church of God. Uh, because I like singing karaoke, we had a good time. And then, back in, I think it's 2005, someone went into that church and shot up that church and killed seven people. That's not called being at the wrong place at the wrong time, that's called being at the right place at the wrong time. And so I, I, I got to go to those funerals, and I can talk more about that another time, the funerals and some of the experiences. But I want you to focus on the fact is, it, you've, you've been in situations, you were doing the right thing, and something bad happened. Does that mean you are a worse sinner than someone else? That's the whole point. Is, were these worse sinners? And there, verse 4, you know, and we talk about the, the towers. 3,000 people died in 9-11 in those towers. Only 18 died in Jerusalem. But the question is asked, were those 18 people on whom the Tower of Siloam fell, were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? Were the 3,000 people, were they the worst sinners? The people getting shot up and killed in Ukraine, are they the worst sinners? Are any good people getting shot up and killed too? Of course they are. So brethren, I'm sh friends, I'm showing you three different ways God works. This can be very enlightening to try to analyze what's going on. You, you may not definitively know which way it is, but you know, okay, these are three biblical possibilities proven from the Bible, and the, on all three, God is sovereign. So I'd like to turn to, in conclusion, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. My friends, if you think about this, this can help you deal with international crisis. This can help you deal with national crisis. It can help you deal with things in your life. If something's bad happening in your life, it's possible, it's possible that God's doing it directly with the details for your good. Personally, I don't think that's the most common one. I guess I think number two is more the most common one. That's what I believe. But it, it Again, I don't know. We'll find out. I, that's just an opinion, which one I think is the most common one. I just know all three exist. But maybe if you're going through a trial, maybe it's something that God is initiating something, and he's letting the devil get his due to get his in there. But he, God keeps parameters, that hedge. By the way, when you're going through a trial, thank God for the hedge. Because it could always get worse. Always thank God for the hedge. The hedge that he puts around you. Always thank God for the hedge. Always. And when you're in the midst of a horrible trial, thank for the hedge. Why would you thank for the hedge when you're going through a bad trial? You go in there and say, Dad, thank you for protecting. I know this could be worse. And then we could be like Christ. 
you know, if it were possible, remove this cup from me, but I'll follow your will. And we can follow the examples of how to pray right out of the Bible. And sometimes if it's time and chance, if time and chance, I, I think there are times when people are in a, an accident's occurring, and God, the son, looks over at the father and says, do you want me to intervene? And the father might say, no, no, let this play out. He, he could, I mean, he, he could put angels around us. We never have any suffering, never have any falls, never have any heart attacks. We start doing something wrong. He could help intervene. But I think there are times then he lets it happen. But he's so good to us. Think about all the times we could be in a mess. Our driving, the other driver, snow, wind, hail, all the things going on. The robbers, the robbery is getting worse. Could God let us be robbed? He could. Could God let us be shot? He could. How many times does he spare? We're going to find out. I'm going to find out in the kingdom how many times he spared me from something that I didn't even know was happening. The, he, he, the father and son are looking like, let's all spare old Dave. Let's not, put, let, let's not let this happen to Dave. But he lets things happen because he, we use it for growing terms. We, Jesus learned what? Through the things he suffered. So if the great, perfect Son of God learned from the things He suffered, we have to do some suffering. But we can talk to God. We, we can negotiate with God like Abraham did. We can, we can relate to God like Moses did. Moses pleaded with God. Moses talk, told God He should change His mind. And God did. Not because Moses is great, but because God is great. And God lets us talk to Him. He has a relationship with us. So, whichever way it is, my friends, whatever approach it is, because all three exist in your life, throughout your life, all three exist. Whatever one happens, when it happens, remember this. 1 Timothy 1.17 Now to the King who is eternal, the King who is immortal, the King who is invisible, to God alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. So my friends, we understand three ways the sovereign God creates calamity. Let's give honor and glory to God forever and ever because He's our King, He's our Dad, He loves us so much.